We've been uh, chatting away for a while, and have, uh, more or less completely it's forgotten. It's now midnight, and you're, you're yeah. locked in. Uh, we've been through spend the rest of the night here. Through, uh, Greek, uh, Greek. Uh, it's not so much a question, but it's more like that, um, it's not that science takes away the awe of um, knowing about the universe, but it makes it less shocking. So if you look at music like Hendrix, you don't mind if you're music and you can't play the guitar, you're like, wow, these noises are incredible, but the more you understand what he does, it's still incredible, but you're not shocked anymore. Mm. Sort of yeah, no, I, so I think that, yeah. Thing. But then in, in one sense, the whole of the aesthetic theory in the 20th century, all the different forms of art in the 20th century have been retreating from what had been the project of art before, which had been to make things more and more precise and realistic. And all those 19th century painters who developed a technique, an extraordinary mm. technique, so that their canvases look like photographs. And there's only so far you can, once you achieve that, that's a kind of dead end. So 20th century art was about finding ways to you know, make other kinds of images that were not precise and accurate and represent the way the universe actually is. Um, mm. Partly because photography renders that redundant. And it's the same with music. Music had explored all the harmonies that it's possible to do, really. So 20th century music becomes about atonal music and about strange new noises that are not harmonious. It's, it's hard to say that Bob Dylan's voice is more beautiful than Maria Callas' voice. But what Bob Dylan's voice has that Maria Callas is incapable of is precisely this kind of dirtiness, this scuzziness that is in the fabric of things. Mm. Now, it's beautiful to listen to Maria Callas. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm saying there's, it's, there's a... I mean, when I write science fiction, people say, oh, it's all escapism, and I understand why they say that, but it seems to me that pure aesthetic experience is more about an escapism. If you listen to Maria Callas and you're transporting, you think, oh, isn't that beautiful? Because it's so precise. It's like a kind of equation made music. And that doesn't seem to be as interesting as the, the music that is uh, dirty and messy and, and fuzzy and, and interestingly contorted and twisted in, in the ways that life actually is, in the way that our human experience and being in the world is. You don't, don't think that's just another kind of equation? That's, yeah. So John Lydon, Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols, who I would say had, I think, the greatest singing voice of the 20th century. <laughs> And it, that was another thing that came to me, because when, he, when I, was a, I was 12 or 13 when the Sex Pistols started releasing stuff, and as a 12-year-old, I thought, that's rubbish, he can't sing at all. He can't even, you know, he's not in tune or anything, that's rubbish, even I can sing better than that. And it was only when I was a student that it suddenly dawned on me that I'd entirely missed the point of what it is that John Lydon does when he sings. He's not trying to be tuneful. He couldn't be tuneful if he wanted to be, but he is being expressive, and he's being expressive in ways that are not open to the perfectly tuneful singer. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm just, I'm just no, 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 I think, but then, I mean, to, to take a, there's a, there's a few, I mean, there's one thing, if you take the art analogy, so, you know, there's, so how, however many different harmonies, or however many different fundamental stories there are, in fact, everything yeah. is just basically a... It's all seven stories there. Yeah, 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 or, or whatever, or there's a, but also within this, this march in science, there's, everything is just a remix, a rehashing, mm. a new thing. In what people focus, what people see is the march of precision, but there's also mm. detail. There's there's detail there, and so a lot of it is just that you know, from Newton to Einstein, from the Greeks to, to then also actually also Einstein. Yeah. You know, so so there's You've a. You've got such a crush on Einstein. It's no, look, he was really now. good. He did a lot of good stuff. His did, all his yeah. best works were outstanding. But <laughs> I suppose I suppose the point is that there are even if you took an equation or something like that, there are bits, there are equations we can write down, you can write down the equation, and there are bits of that equation you cannot know. Just you cannot calculate. There's nothing you can do about it. When you try and calculate something from it, just because you can write it down on a piece of paper, you write it down, and there are chunks of that equation you cannot calculate completely. And then you just make some approximations oh, and you do so, yeah. you have dirtiness. Now we're talking. Yeah. And yeah. then a number will come out, and it's remarkable. That number matches up with reality. Not, so it's, the, it's not knowable, there's no precision. There's, in fact, huge bits which are completely opaque to us. But, and, and so, so we, we, I'm just going to say the phrase fake news again. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just pulling stuff out of a hat. No, there are, to fit. You can write down an equation which, uh, which, you, which is messy, and you can't, you can't write everything down. You can't solve, mm. but we know it's right. I mean, that's, that's quite a frightening concept. That is quite frightening. I didn't know that about... about oh, the whole of particle physics is based on class, messy classes of equations, which you can't solve completely. Right. 
And then we, we, we gave the process of throwing away and changing and modifying those equations, renormalization, which basically means change the bits we can't calculate. We made that, that process of hiding away the dirty pieces. We gave it a name and a mathematical prescription. Yeah. So there are bits which are unknowable, even just deep down in the equations. You can write down an equation, that bit will never know. Well, we don't, we can't compute it today. So we don't, it's not, it's not completely like that. It's also, it's about, yeah, so I, I mean, you're probably right. We could, we could draw an equation that would explain why John Lydon's voice works the way it does, <laughs> which would have to do with his voice box. Or Hendrix's yeah. strange teeth. Or, yeah, or Hendrix's... Um, because he was left-handed or whatever. But, yeah. But I think... Uh, the, the, lots of physicists talk about beauty in the physics, and they would throw away a, an equation or an idea because they thought it didn't have an aesthetic property. But is that aesthetic property? So when people think of you know, the uncertainty principle, say, is that in itself beautiful, or is that just a kind of obstruction to getting at the, the reality of particle physics? Wouldn't it be great if you could do away with all that? Yeah, it would be. Messiness? But, but there is. There are. As opposed to the other line of thinking, which is maybe the uncertainty principle is what's beautiful about particle physics. Yeah, I, I don't... You're not persuaded? No, I don't, I don't know about... There is a clear... In the last century, a clear aesthetic that people would head towards elegance, mm. or what they regarded as elegance. And you read about this in science books. Right. And so the, but it's in that form, that, 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 that form you dislike, where it's kind of symmetric, yeah. highly symmetric, hyper-real, yeah, like a yeah. photograph of the universe, something which is you could describe everything. So... Yeah, no. I'm Which, yeah, you wouldn't like. I'm not, I'm not, not a fan. I'm not on board with that, no. I want to see the Sex Pistols version of physics. <laughs> Maybe the Ramones. I may go with, I mean, the, Ra I may yeah. go with the Ramones. I, I, I do like the Ramones. The Ramones seem to me... <laughs> when I was younger, the thing that's really powerful about the Sex Pistols music, I'm sounding very pompous, I'm a middle-aged <laughs> professor with a bald head talking about punk rock. But then punk rock is a historical curio now, isn't it? Yeah. The thing that's really interesting about the Sex Pistols was how angry they were. And people hadn't done angry musically before, not as effectively, not in a way that was so eloquent, that spoke to an entire generation. Anger's very important. The Ramones, they're not angry. I don't know what they are. They're I'm going to try this tomorrow. I'm going to try angry physics. Angry physics. I'm going to try it with, uh, yeah, a little bit more... Uh, a little I mean, bit more I mean, the, the, there's, there's a, an argument. The, I'm not sure how persuasive you'd find it. This is what Adorno and Horkheimer say in their dialectic of the Enlightenment. They say, the logic, the cultural logic of the Enlightenment, which is where modern science you know, comes out of, this idea that everything has to be ordered rationally, that everything has to be illuminated, they say it leads directly to the Nazi death camp. They say that the Holocaust <laughs> is, the, is the kind of logical extension of, the, of what the Enlightenment means. That's what that, if you read the Dialectic of Enlightenment, that's the case they argue there. That there's a, a sense that what the Nazis wanted to do was they wanted to do away with all the, the, I mean, all the messiness and all the, the impurities in society. They had this utopian ideal, utopian in inverted commas, that this is what constituted a healthy, pure, noble society. I mean, they're clearly, they're, I'm not <laughs> advocating <laughs> Nazi views, clearly, because that seems to me entirely to miss the point about what society is. So, so society well, is, is beautiful messy... because it is messy and diverse, and, and you know, if, you, if you kill all the Jews, you make society much less interesting and beautiful than if you keep Jews and Aryans mingling in together. Mm. But that's, there's, there's a kind of, you can, you, you may agree or disagree with what Adorno and Horkheimer say, but you can see, kind of see why they say it. Yeah, so but that's I, baked into the logic of the Enlightenment itself, which is, we're, we're doing away with all the, all the cobwebs and all the, all the... Yeah, and there is, there is, in hushed tones, physicists would just go to the logical conclusion of the, the ultimate logical, you know, Mm. What's the point of writing this paper? The, the sun is going to explode yeah. <laughs> in five billion years. I might yeah. as well just leave it. That is true. So, you know, but we, that's kind of where your average physicist mind goes. But in the same way of trying to keep one hat on, being, mm. keeping a human hat on one time, and putting your physicist hat on the other, it's, it's easy to switch. So the human hat's not made of humans? No, no, it's not a hat made of human. It's, the, it's the more kind of... Uh, bit, oh, uh, more, bit, less, less physicist. Like Silence of the Lambs. That would be a bit horrible. No, no, no. no. It's just, it's a, I'm not it's, suggesting that all physicists are serial killers, but just clearly just a proportion. Just a very small fraction. <laughs> that's true, Royal Holloway. <laughs> any, any, other, any other questions or any other kind of thoughts or uh, any paradoxes or, or thought experiments you've ever conducted? We were going to talk about the grandfather paradox. Yeah, no, we, we, we kind of got stuck up on that. We got, we got a bit carried away. With Olver. We can't apologise enough. 
two questions. Is that allowed? Yeah, no, 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 yeah, 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 sorry. So you're talking about the cosmic microwave battery. Yeah. But the picture that I can imagine and I remember seeing of that is like a multicolored green and blue map. It's, it's, yeah, you see actually, uh, it's like, uh, it varies. It's kind of that, stippled, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like very, but that's a very small variation. We took, um, that was only about 20 years we got a first picture like that. And that's because we had to. We sent uh, the radio detector into space, away from the atmosphere, and uh, and all all sources of uh, uh, microwave radiation here on Earth, and so we could see that small variation, and that that variation is what seeded the original structure we think of the universe. Little variations, a hotter piece there, hotter gas would be less dense, and it would have expelled some material, and so that would there would be a void there, and then when it when it was cooler, it would clump together, and you see like a ribbon a supercluster of galaxies in some region. And so that distribution, that unevenness in a cup of tea, like imagine you had a little bit of a swirl in a cup of tea, or the one side was a little, the top was a bit cooler, mm. you'd find more material there. So you see that variation. So it's very, very small. We, we of course did it in a blue red color scale, but it's a thousandth of a degree less, a millionth of a degree. Such clashing colors. It's just so, yeah, it's terrible. But not that many, so the difference between us, it's microscopically uniform. It's in, there's inhomogeneity, so incredibly small scale. But this goes back to the point about when so you divide nature down to its yeah. smallest point. Eventually, however smooth it looks, you're going to find something there. You get granular. Yeah, you're going to find some granularity. I mean, also, the difference, I suppose, is I don't know. The difference is if you look at the night sky, the difference between a star and the black, black. bit next to the star is very extreme. Yeah. Where well, the differences we're talking about with the cosmic background, the, the background radiation is very. That's small minute, differences, yeah. but it is spread all the way across the sky. Yep. That's what you're saying. We do notice a very small effect where if you're if you're if you if you're through, you're looking you're in an oven you're in a perfect massive universe scale oven. I'm not saying you're all Nazis, but now you've put yes. it in an oven. <laughs> no, we're you're all just in a massive. Go there. You can't help oven. yourself. <laughs> I just want everyone to die. <laughs> so, if you're traveling if you're traveling one way through this huge oven, you, yeah. look, in the direction of travel, you'd see it a little bit uh, bluer, so hotter. And looking backwards, you see it a little bit redder. So you would see overall a, a slight difference as you move into the into the light. Into the light. Into, don't into go the into the, the light. If, yeah. I, so if you, you have you one takeaway from this evening, don't go into, into the, the light. light. Otherwise, we'll never see you again. You'll vanish. And so yeah. So so there is. A, yeah. yeah. So that, that is that experiment. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Or any. Oh. What's your scale? What's your, what's your comparison? Um, it's like yeah. that Father Ted episode. It, no, I do that in my class. This is small and those no, are Does away. anyone know what this is? Yeah, Dougal, this cow is small. He's holding a toy cow. cow. <laughs> this one is small. small and and those ones through the window are far Big away. Big and far Actual away. cows. No, but that's very, very instructive. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, uh, it's a big black sheet. We've covered the Earth at, the, at uh, about a million, a million kilometers out from the center of the Earth with a huge, very, very, very black sheet. And then we took a team of people with, I don't know, something sharp, and then just made a bunch of holes, which then is what the universe looks like, you know, with galaxies and stuff. And we did like, colored filters. It's a massive art project. Could be. Could be. You, you can't don't, prove that it isn't. Well, yeah, it's very hard to prove yeah. otherwise. So, which is exactly the point. Is it a toy cow that's very close and I'm just holding up? And what's the scale, right? So we've, uh, physicists have been trying to do this and challenging this concept for a long, long, long time to take a ruler and move it around the universe. You're right. The only reason you know the scale of me and Adam is because you've seen humans before. And you, and you know about You have what, seen humans before, I take it. Yeah, you've seen yeah. before today. Yeah. And the glass, and you, you have a sense of scale. Or well, really, if we had a, a meter stick here, you'd know, you'd have a sense. And we could put that next to some object. Yeah. But it's very hard to work out. And we've, we've, we've taken our ruler, which is basically the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and we've moved that ruler around the universe as much as we can. And that's what we've done. We've really taken the Earth-Sun distance, that distance that we know very well, and we've extrapolated that to the whole scale of the universe. But it's a challenge. It's, imagine, I mean, imagine trying to pigeon step 
to the nearest star. I mean, maybe you know the scale of one thing, your shoe size, or the size of, the size of Adam here, and uh, you just move that around. It's, it's actually a very difficult process, and actually potentially coming easier because the more different ways we can look back in the, look in the universe in different ways, the, the way of measuring it is all done with light, in, with the light. Yeah. And we look at different forms of light from different places. Standard candles, a known amount of light. Mm. So a headlight, which is a fixed brightness a certain distance away. And if it's very, very faint, we know that thing is very far away. But we've actually got different messages now coming. Gravity waves, which we discovered last year, is a different message. And we can work out the distance of those gravity waves. So we have a different ruler. So we just check that those rulers all agree. We say the universe is expanding in its dark energy. That's actually just code, a science code, for effectively the universe is expanding. It could be that our ruler is changing. It's very hard to work out either way. And that, it all gets reduced down to Dougal. This cow is small and very close, and that cow is big and far away. And we're trying to resolve that all the time yeah, to, to try and understand those differences. But we'll never go there. You'll never touch it. You can only do a thought experiment. What if the universe was slightly bent like this? Mm. What, what if uh, that, was, that was the case? You, you run those experiments. Sometimes you get to do an experiment. Okay, I and know trying. The, <coughs> the 18th century French astronomer Laplace, who was the guy who, who, came, who theorized galaxies and said, this, this isn't a milky nebula, these are millions of little tiny stars. He came up with a, a three-dimensional model of the universe that was predicated on what he took to be what he assumed to be true, which was that all stars would be exactly the same brightness. And on the strength of that presumption, he drew a map of the universe. To move, to move them out at different distances. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> if, if a star is very faint, it would be the same brightness as our sun, but it must just be this much further away. Now, of course, actual stars are all different brightnesses and sizes and, and you know, spectra Changed. and so on. Yeah. That's the really tricky part. He made the but tube read, map the reason, of I, the universe. I, he did. And I read, I read a paper that someone had done a few years ago. I read an account of the paper in The New Scientist where they put... Laplace's calculations into a computer, and it turned out he was kind of right. If all the stars in the universe were exactly the same size and the same brightness, then his map of the universe was surprisingly accurate, which is bully well, for him. On average, yeah. Just turns out he was wrong, because all the stars are different sizes and different brightnesses. That's the part I can't work out. How do you know? How do you know? It? That's kind of your question, though, isn't it? If a star is very faint, is it because it's a long, long way away and not very bright? Because... Or is it because it's quite close and just the, because dim? The we, we, laws of physics that we do know here, that we have tested and you go to the physics lab and you test, and you take the same material, you understand hydrogen, for example, and you look at a star, physics operates in that star in the same way here on Earth as it does there. You assume it does. We assume it does, but it looks very familiar. Yeah. It's, I mean, it looks You've exactly the same. You've never been there. It's, I, I know. Fake news. It's all it's, fake news. No, it's but fake the whole point is you expand you your inability to go, do you, do you, do you really want to do, like, mm, this star is hot? <laughs> and then just back away a little bit, all oh, pretty hot. <laughs> yeah. It's instructive to think about what it would be like to be at the surface of the sun with a huge amount of x-rays and heat and the, the blinding light and the churning surface, it's great to go there in your mind. Sounds like a hangover. <laughs> it does. Oh, okay. But then to, to, to know that you're quite safe. Sorry, you had a question. You had a question. Oh, yeah. um, when did, did dark matter, was, was it always there? We think it was formed sometime later, not, not right at the beginning. In fact, we, the it's very- It's an invasion. It's not it's an invasion from the- uh, From the dark universe. It's not an invasion. Well, Maybe it, it's well, not an invasion. Um, but, um, the, we, we believe that, 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 well, yeah, again, so you talk about in these terms. When you don't know, it's we believe. Yeah. So um, after the Big Bang, uh, physics, this is, okay, this sounds like fake news. I'm going to give you okay. while I explain this. Um, the laws of physics don't change, but we see different features of them. Okay, so over time you see different bits of physics. Would you say that steam is the same, water vapor is the same as water, liquid water or ice? Would you say that they're the same substance? You know, water, is water water? In whatever way you saw it, would you say that steam is super different from... Uh, because it's hotter. Yeah, because it's hotter and it look, has a very different form, this gaseous sort of nebulous stuff yeah. and, and liquid water, you'd have a glass of okay. water and ice, like solid ice. So. Physics, although it's, it's the same stuff and it obeys the same sort of sets of physical law, water, you see it in these different forms. So early on, there was a transition of the universe from one phase, one state to another. And what part of the byproduct of that change was the dark matter. 
that we would have why, left why it. Why is there so much of it then? Why is there such a high proportion of what's left? It's a, it's a surprise that there's any matter at all. Oh, really? <laughs> it's actually, no, it's actually, why yeah. would there be any matter? If the universe was created perfectly symmetrically, matter, antimatter, and all annihilated, yeah. why aren't we just in a universe of radiation? There mm. must have been, right at the beginning, a small, you're, you're saying a little, you know, it's not perfectly symmetric or precise. The universe started off with a huge amount of matter and there was just a small difference. Yeah. And that residual small difference is everything that's been left. But why would the universe be made very, very slightly asymmetric? Because it's not, it's the mess. It's the slight it's the, bit of mess. Jimi Hendrix's guitar distortion. That's what makes everything. That's the premise that every, all your discipline is based on. It's a small, yeah, the residual piece of mess. So I would say early after the Big Bang. But there's many, there's lots of questions still like that. What, why, why we see, why there's a slight asymmetry. Mm. And that's, you know, if we resolve that, we'd explain where the dark matter and the normal matter came from. Right. And we would still be left with some darkness. I, mean, well, I don't even know the percentages, right? I've, I've copied them. <laughs> Did you copy them down? I copied them off Wikipedia, so, so it must be true. What I've written down is 4.9% ordinary matter, 26.8% dark matter, so more than a quarter dark matter, and 68.3% dark energy. So nearly three quarters dark energy and a, nearly a quarter dark matter and then the tiny little fraction of actual matter which is us and everything we can see and feel and eat and taste yeah so so visible matter is one tenth of five percent one tenth of one twentieth of everything which is not much and but, but that all of that probably was it, you could imagine we just don't know how much original matter there was and it was just a slight asymmetry between yeah. those matter and antimatter and so how much there was in the beginning is quite frightening and Thankfully, there was a, a slight screw up. Of course, on the, you know, not no, not screw up. The good bit in life, exactly. in the universe, the creative, creative force, right, of, yeah. uh, the obstacle that, that to made the something perfect good. symmetry, the Nazi symmetry that would have eliminated <laughs> the Nazi everything. symmetry of physics. A perfectly clean universe. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any other uh, questions or thoughts or? Uh... Oh, cool. Ah, yes. I watched very recently. I just wondered with writing contemporary science fiction, do you find an advantage in exploiting what we don't know about technology? Um, kind of like the step of wives did in that not everyone had smartphones or phones at all or things like that. Or do you find an advantage in because technology is so accessible to us now, most people in this room have a smartphone, exploiting what we do know about? If you're asking me personally, then I think that what's... So the way I come at that, to answer that, is, is by saying... I mean, The Stepford Wives... I, I remember seeing The Stepford Wives. The Stepford Wives is quite a clever film. It's a cleverer film than people think it is. So you know the premise of The Stepford Wives. Uh, it's, it's a community in North America, and a, a couple move in, and it's, something's wrong with this community. That All the husbands are kind of like normal guys, and they look like me, you know. And all the wives are extraordinarily young and beautiful and, and perfect and well-mannered and subservient to their husbands. And it turns out that they've been kind of made. They're artificial wives. And they're supposed to be a kind of man's ideal dream of what they want in a, in a partner. Uh, and who will always... There's a speech one of the characters makes at the end saying, who wouldn't, what, what man wouldn't want this? You know, no matter how old and disgusting I get, she's always going to love me. And, it, you can, and there are people, I suppose, who would like that, who would prefer to have a sex bot rather than have an actual girlfriend or actual wife or actual boyfriend or actual husband. Um, but I don't think that's how people are generally. And I think that's what's so eloquent about the Stepford Wives. What it does is it's a kind of dystopia, and it shows you that what makes actual relationships worthwhile, what makes you fall in love with someone, is not their physical perfection and not the way that they adhere to a particular model of what a man or a woman should be. It's all the ways in which they deviate from that. It's all their idiosyncrasies and their particularities. And that's what makes love endure as you get, I mean, I'm saying, hopefully, as I look at my wife, as you get older and more pot-bellied and your legs get skinny and you lose all your hair and so on, you're thinking, well, that's not, it wasn't, my wife didn't marry me. <laughs> for my, <laughs> feel like you get your for my full head of hair. <laughs> I'm thinking, I did have, used to have a full head of hair when she married me, and now 
And the reason I'm pausing is because we watched the recent Tarzan movie uh, with Alexander Skarsgård playing Tarzan. And it's a rubbish movie, that. But we watched it and she was enjoying herself and she had a glass of wine. And every now and again she'd be watching it and she'd look at me like this on the couch. <laughs> and then she turned back to the thing. I was thinking, and look back at Tarzan. <laughs> okay. I don't look like Alexander Skarsgård. Right. If I took my top off now, you'd see that I don't look like Alexander Skarsgård. Then if you were Skarsgård. a Stepford husband, though. But the Stepford wives is kind of like a photographic negative. It, it, the more you think about it, the more you think it would be horrible to be married to a robotic, perfect wife. That, there'd, be no, there'd be no joy in that. There'd be no fun, there'd be no love, there'd be no humanity. That's, so that's what's interesting about that. The, it's, the, it's the places where technology breaks down that makes a story. That if, you, if you're writing a story about Superman, there is no story about Superman. He has all the superpowers. In order to make a story about Superman, you have to have the kryptonite. You have to take some of his powers away. Because the whole essence of any storytelling, I mean, this is, it relates to science, I suppose, in a way, in the, insofar as we were talking earlier that science is also driven by stories, but it certainly relates to what, what I'm doing when I write stories. You need drama, and drama needs conflict. And if everything's perfect, if you, if you live in a perfect utopia, it's why utopias are all so dull. When you read lots and lots of earnest utopian novels that were written in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and they, they, they thought very long and hard about how to make a perfect society, and they're incredibly dull, because that's not what makes stories interesting. And there's a downside to that as well, and of course there is. But when we watch the news, we tell ourselves, are oh, we watching the news to be informed about the world? We're not. We're watching the news for interesting stories, because we love stories. So the news has to constantly find stories that will entertain us. It can't simply give us the facts about the universe or we turn off. So it concentrates on particular kinds of news stories where there is conflict and drama. And that creates an ambiance where we think, oh, the world is full of serial killers and terrorists and everything is going wrong. And that, because those make more interesting stories, actually the world is not that way. Actually, if you look at the data, if you look at the World Health Organization data, everything about life has got better for everyone. Longevity and, and child mortality has gone down and people are living longer and nutrition is better and that's a, it's, it's improved for some people more than it's improved for other people, but it's improved for everyone over the last hundred years. But that's not a story. That's, that's, that doesn't engage us. What engages us is, oh, the Muslim terrorists are coming across to, to kill us and then we get excited and, and scared and then we're engaged. So there's a, of course there's a downside to the way that stories are structured. And I, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never seen like thinking about physics as an intellectual utopia. Yeah. <laughs> where, you know, where you can go away and everything's kind of neat and perfect spheres and stuff and, yeah. and little boxes and beautiful equations. It doesn't, it still feels messy. Right. It's, it still feels human. Yeah. It's still, it's, it's very powerful, but it doesn't feel like a, a kind of uh, an ivory or a, a glass tower that you mm. can, for your mind. Some, I think I'm sure there's, there's a bit of it. There is a bit of escapism, and there's a bit of. What was the what was the comic lander called? The Phil Phil lander. The lander yeah, the Phil Yeah. That landed on the comic. Yeah. Fell so over. It fell over. Yeah. That's what was great about that story. I mean, that, if you think about that, that's an astonishing achievement that they managed to shoot this land lander and it was like, landed oh. on a comet, but then it didn't land right, and that makes an interesting story. And it's in a little valley, and we can't get. Into, maybe it'll, the comet will turn, and we'll get some data. Maybe. And suddenly, it's suspenseful and interesting. And, as a scientist, you don't want that. You just want the data to come back to find out interesting things about comets, don't you? Yeah. Well, the LHC, LHC exploding <laughs> one day was also... Yeah. Yeah, which was also... Lots, lots of people were very interested. Lots of us were very well, I, upset. I, I would prefer that not to happen. Particularly if you were, it happened to be there at the time. I think it would be bad <laughs> if it exploded, wouldn't it? I think that yeah. would be a... Yeah, no, I do get your point about utopias, yeah. But yeah. And any, anyone else? Like, it's getting a bit late. I don't know if that, did that answer your question in any way? I don't know. This is, yeah, well, I was just <laughs> rambling on. The, the smartphone thing interests me because it seems to me that we are now, without even thinking about it, we are all cyborgs. You can't leave the house in the morning without your smartphone. The, the, my smartphone now functions as an extension of my brain. And I just take it for granted. It's got all this stuff I don't have to remember. It's just in there. If I don't know it, I can look it up on the World Wide Web. And it's... It, the Cyborg seems like a very... I, mean, I suppose that is a... It's a robot, isn't it, that? Mm. With a beautiful face. Um, cyborg seems like a, 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 a bizarre and alien and science fiction concept, but we are all cyborgs. We're all... We're all 
wearing prostheses, you've got your glasses on. You weren't born wearing those, I suppose. Or perhaps you were, I don't know. No. Um, and that's interesting, that's exciting, except that it becomes mundane. So then the, you, need to find, you need to push it further to make something interesting that you can make a story out of. How are we doing? I think, yeah, I think uh, we're, we're almost yeah. at eight. So it's been a, eight. actually a rather a okay, long time. Got, I'm going to ask you a question then. All right, one last I've question. I've got you here, one last yeah. question. Yeah. We didn't get around to talking about the grandfather paradox about time travel. As a physicist, you would tell me that, as Einstein says, we live in space-time and that time is like a dimension, like length and breadth and height. Would you? Yeah. So why can I move anywhere I like, lengthwise, breadthwise, or heightwise? Why can't I move anywhere I like in time, if it's just a dimension? I can go anywhere I like in space. I can go back to Croydon, where I grew up, but I can't go back to 1975. I mean, why would I want to? But that's just for the <laughs> sake of the argument. No smartphones. No, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so... If it's just another dimension, it's very easy to move lengthwise. Why is it not easy to move time-wise? The, the, we found some incredible similarities between space and time, right. mathematically. And you take that concept and you say, ooh, ooh, if we treat in the mathematical form of this, time, incredibly like space, almost interchangeably, almost, but not quite interchangeably, we, we could work out a great deal about the universe as we see it. So mm. this is Einstein's special relativity. Mm. But intrinsically, there is a difference with time. It's not there. In all the equations, it is a dimension, but it appears in different places, in different constructs. So, it, it, mm. so, so although we regard it as a dimension, it appears separated from the spatial ones. And it always appears on the other side of an equation or in a different location. Ooh. So you could totally interchange x and y. If you look that way, you could interchange it with this direction. And it wouldn't make any difference. If you looked at all the stars and you, were in the, you weren't particularly close to one galaxy and you looked that way and then you looked that way, would it, would it be different? And the answer would be, would be no. And, or you moved, you walked 10 spaces or four galaxies. Yeah. It wouldn't, wouldn't be any different. We're looking, clearly looking today and tomorrow. So although we, we've we've harmonized the mathematics and we do call it a, a, a unified space-time. There's nothing in those equations, in those equations, which prevent you moving. And things move back and forth in time all the time. <clears throat> yeah, in fact, we describe particles, one type of particle is going forwards in time, one describe one particle going backwards in time. We look over, when we do calculations, we compute all the different paths that a particle can take in all different space-time, in all the different directions, and we add up all the different possibilities. But there's only... There's, there's, there's certain rules which only go one way, and so there's thermodynamics and other things. So we, we believe that we cannot move arbitrarily in, in time. Mm. So yeah, we do move all the time, in time, but at we a are. fixed rate. Yeah, one second per second. Second, yeah, for every day. I just, I, there's a part of me that, I mean, I, I can see an answer that would say, so Heidegger, the German philosopher, there's a German theme running through this evening, clearly. Heidegger read Einstein and said, Einstein's clearly wrong for this very common sense reason, that if time is another dimension of space, then we ought to be able to move around in it, but we can't. We can move anywhere we like in space and not in time. And I can see the answer that says, well, we might be able to move in time. I mean, we can't, I can't arbitrarily go up a, a mile as I am now. I need a rocket to take me up in that, in that direction. I can do it. It's possible for me to do it. I can't do it right now. Maybe I just, we just need to develop the technology that would enable us to move in time. We just haven't worked out, worked out what it is. Or are you saying... We can't move in time. I think there as, are strong as, consistency arguments with moving arbitrarily back in time. So, if if if, if uh, uh, even just not the if you were if you were one kilometer up and you had the rocket, it wouldn't change. It wouldn't change much. But if even information traveling back in the in the wrong order would yeah. cause a problem, a real problem. So, being told that you were about you know we we left today and. Uh, there's, you would, uh, you would, you would, I mean, this is going to be a little bit dark. You die when you leave today. It's hypothetical. Just it's, it's, it's I, call a, a, I call you a Nazi one I'm time. And I'm going to kill you. And that's so now you're you, going to kill you me. Die when you, leave this, uh, you die when you leave this place. Um, would you leave? 
I mean, what if you actually even saw the event in the future? You, you, there was a video camera pointing to five minutes in the future. Right. And you saw yourself five minutes older ha- suffering. Yeah, you know, I've had a good innings. I can't really complain. Well, you'd be really philosophical should, about it. I, I so it has, there, there are so many loops. In, in, and then, so mm. then you don't go. And of course, you're not there to be killed. And so there's, the, 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 the space doesn't suffer from any of those problems. Being here or being, being, uh, uh, being over there at the right time, mm. there's, there's no problem. You can't see any logical issue with that. But as soon as you think of the smallest thing, somebody gives you a phone call and says, I'm you from the future, don't go to work tomorrow, don't write that book, do write that book. Well, I'm confused now. What do I <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, no, but I any of these different which, possibilities. Which, I mean, anything that modifies your behavior. Yeah. It, it doesn't even have to be physical matter. It doesn't even have to be, it's just information. It. There's a paradox with information, Tran. And this, yeah. is the, this is the problem with not even just time travel, grandfather paradox, but the tachyonic telephone. You get a phone call from the future. I have a twin brother, so I actually get phone calls from the future. Because he's or the past. Guy. No, because he sounds like me. And so oh. when I shared a flat and he called, and I'd play the message, it sounds like me. And I'm like, wow, when did I leave that message? <laughs> and then, of course, we're thinking for other solutions, which aren't, uh, it was just my twin brother calling and uh, coming uh, for dinner. Matthew it was me element, calling... Right? A few weeks ago, and the stupid housemates didn't delete the th- and I get yeah. myself into real bother. Because, yeah. no, it's not time travel. It's okay. Or I wasn't there. That was him. But even just the, the, just the, the piece of information would distort things too much. Mm. But in terms of physics, a lot of equations, it doesn't bother them. A lot of physics, it doesn't bother them. But th- there is always a difference between time and space. In Einstein's theory, he merged it into one space-time, and we got a huge amount of mileage out of that. But it's not, that's just explaining the nature of space and time itself, not what happens inside it. Yeah. Okay, that's what the difference is. Oh, okay. Okay, so. I think I see the distinction you're making. Yeah, no, because we, we just made the theatre part of our uh, physics, right? So it's, yeah. that's what Einstein did. He made uh, space and time part of physics. And so then particles doing things in that space time uh, would move in that space time, but they could only do it in one particular way. Right. It's a little hard for me to see why tachyons are allowed to go back in time, but I'm not. Ah, but tachyons... I'm, just, I'm a bunch of particles arranged in a particular way, so... Yeah, but then they have, yeah, they have a certain property that they, they, uh, they travel faster mm. than the speed of light. So... It sounds like you're saying I can't go travel in time because oh, it would be too messy. Too, yeah, too difficult. Too difficult. That's another euphemism for messy. It's too difficult being <laughs> infinite, infinite <laughs> amounts of energy. Too infinite. Too infinite, okay. Yeah. I, uh, you don't like infinity, that's the no. problem. No. We are chatting on. Have we got any more questions? I don't want to... We don't want yeah, to I think uh, in which case, if uh, it's worth... Uh, are you, it's, I have to say, you haven't answered my question at all. Yeah, which one? No good, they're about time travel. It's about, I would say, yeah, I would say, uh, I would say probably not. I'm not. You know, I'm not having a go. I'm just saying. <laughs> I was going to say that the, the physics is looking unlikely. OK, and I'm, I'm a bit scared you're going to kill me now. So <laughs> <laughs> totally. I might back off. So. <laughs> um, it'd be nice. No, have a, have a, do a, always do a thought experiment. What if? I mean, I think, uh, I mm. think that's always... I mean, that's, I, I, I like that. I've always thought that's consistent between both of us. Science fiction is what if. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there have been plenty of science fiction answers to the, that particular problem. Yeah. And most, I suppose, the, the consensus, science fictionally speaking, is that you, we are in a multiverse. There is a version where I get killed outside and a version where I don't, depending on whether I've seen that information or not. And that, isn't, that doesn't bifurcate into a, a impossible infinities because many of the different paths cancel one another out. So we end up with a kind of manageable, finite multiverse, which is possible. You don't know. I think, presumably, there's evidence for a multiverse. No evidence. What about the two slits experiment? That's not, that's, not, that's, not an ev- that's not evidence. Something's interfering with them, but it's nothing in our universe. What about crystals? What about astrology, eh? <laughs> no, you see, you can't, you can't definitely... Um, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think uh, no, conducting thought experiments uh, is always uh, worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever your thought, whatever your X is, whatever your thought is. So in which case, thanks for coming. Thank you guys. Yeah. No. Oh no. I think we finally worn you down. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, go to uh, Comma Press. Have a try and find a copy of the book, and or read up about one of the individual paradoxes. Yeah. I mean it's. It's worthwhile. Don't, don't, don't get hung up on them, though. Read down to the bottom of the Wikipedia page and find the yeah. resolution. <laughs> a lot of them, there, are, there is one. There is yeah, a, yeah, there is supposedly. A okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much for coming.